Granville and Damrata are currently discussing Hinata's survival and the demon plaguing Falmouth. After slinging a few insults back and forth, Granville states they should work together to prevent Tempest from gaining financial superiority. This merchant, however, declines this offer, though he does agree not to interfere. Granted, he's not exactly against betraying Granville if the need arose. Damrata then takes his leave as Granville thinks about how much he dislikes that merchant. An unknown amount of time later, Damrata reports back to the leader of Cerberus. This boy assumed everything would turn out like this, since Rimuru is too kind to kill Hinata. Damrata then thinks he should lay low, as the boy says they'll have Misha, one of the other underbosses, take over for him. They both agree it's best to shut down the slave trade, just as Damrata leaves. The secretary, named Kazalim, wonders why they're stopping the slaves, prompting the boy to explain it's just too dangerous since Rimuru now controls the entire forest. The secretary then asks to be called Kagali, until she gets her revenge against Leon. Only then will she resume the title, Demon Lord Kazalim. Back at Tempest, Luis explains how it was he and his dead brother's idea to turn Valentine into the god Luminous. Hinata then addresses her soldiers, openly admitting to deceiving all of them, and that she'll be forced to execute anyone who leaks info regarding Luminous. Arnaud still wonders if Hinata is being threatened, but she boldly exclaims to be serving Demon Lord Valentine by choice. This causes Rimuru to worry that infighting may break out within the Paladins, but Arnaud tells him that everyone fully trusts in Hinata's leadership. Besides, nobody is brave enough to oppose them, after witnessing Demon Lord Valentine all out attacking Valdora, as punishment for revealing her secret identity. This dragon swoops down behind Rimuru, claiming that Valentine won't accept his apology. Luminous orders Veldora to be handed over, and Rimuru gladly obliges. Demon Lord Valentine then pulls Veldora into a bear hug, causing him to scream out in agony. Embracing Drain is able to attack the soul directly. Rimuru then reveals this man to be the legendary storm dragon Veldora, and Hinata is quick to reveal her disappointment. Veldora's magic reserves have fallen back to a stable level. A moment later, Rigurd arrives, explaining that he's prepared accommodations for everyone. Hinata says that's not necessary, followed by him revealing they will be hosting a party tomorrow. Veldora is immediately excited to start drinking, and Luminous is looking forward to trying some new food. Though one of her servants declares it'd be irresponsible to stay, so they just order him to leave. The first activity on the schedule is taking a bath and changing clothes. Rimuru explains there is three different bathhouses, two being gender specific and one mixed. The male paladins get excited upon hearing this, until Hinata asks Luminous to join her in the women's only bath. Without hesitation, Rimuru begins to escort the ladies, but Hinata isn't so easily deceived. Shion offers to be their guide, as Hinata points out that Rimuru was a man in his previous life. However, Shion doesn't think that's an issue, though Hinata states this is a good opportunity for Shion to prove her reliableness to Rimuru. The two Biscuiteers then offer to help Shion, causing Rimuru to finally give up on bathing with Hinata. Now, the guys are excited that Rimuru will be joining them. That is until Shuna asks what they think they're doing. She then forces Rimuru to bathe alone, and proclaims she'll be speaking with Binimaru and Soe later. After his very lonely bath, Rimuru heads to the banquet hall, where he thinks about how far Tempest has come. Using his memories, Shuna has recreated multiple Japanese dishes, and Shion has even used her master chef skill to forcibly recreate white rice. The next major culinary step Rimuru has in mind is to create trains, which will allow them to easily transport ingredients. A short while later, everyone arrives wearing traditional Japanese clothing. Hinata swiftly begins apologizing, as Rimuru is momentarily stunned by her beauty, causing Shuna to give him a death glare. He gladly declares that all is forgiven, if they can just quit assuming that all monsters are evil. With a glance her way, Luminous states that's fine with her, as long as the people's faith doesn't waver. With a collective bow, the paladins show their earnest apology, prompting Rigurd to admit that he believed all humans were evil until Rimuru changed his mind. Binimaru and Soe exclaim they're glad to become friends, as they both admit that Hinata is stronger than both of them. Though due to Shion's previous death, she's not fully on board. 
but it only takes a single remark from Rimuru to completely change her mind. With a brief toast, the feast begins, as plates full of tempura, sashimi, and soy sauce are brought out. Amid her disbelief, Hinata mutters this is going too far, and asks how long it took to recreate all of this. Rimuru proudly explains that it wasn't that difficult thanks to the variety of monster skills at their disposal. She declares that to be a selfish use of authority, but Luminous doesn't see the harm, because this new food is absolutely delicious. It's then revealed that it's possible to suppress your own poison immunity, and Rimuru demands to be taught how. Our three catastrophe-level beings then share in a drinking contest, as they watch over the paladins intermingling with the monsters. Fritz then takes a bite out of the magical black rice, causing the drunk Rimuru to suddenly remember that it's poisonous to humans. Fritz's magic resistance is able to break down the magicules. The rest of the paladins dig in as well, though Hinata is put off by the unusual caller. This cheerful partying then continues well into the night. Rimuru wakes up with a massive hangover. That's what you get for purposely weakening yourself. While heading over to the meeting hall, he takes a moment to think about how Yom will be crowned king soon enough. The meeting begins with both sides discussing Fullmuth's attack on Tempest, and Hinata admits that some merchants tricked her by saying that Rimuru killed Shizu. Our slime responds by pointing out that Clayman had frequent contact with Eastern merchants, before exclaiming that it still pisses him off that Hinata ambushed him. Luminous orders him to control his aura, followed by everyone discussing a merchant named Dom, and whether or not Clayman was behind Falmuth's attack. It's also likely that Clayman was just a puppet himself, and it's suggested that maybe the Seven Days were the true masterminds. Luminous denies all possibility of this, but Luis isn't so sure. He reveals that Luminous occasionally performs a ceremony that bestows part of her power onto the clergy. Though it's been hundreds of years since the last one, which has caused the clergy to grow very old. Due to her eternal lifespan, Luminous didn't realize how much time has passed, and Louis suspects the clergy were getting desperate for her attention. Rimuru still believes one member of the clergy to be alive, but Hinata reveals that Nicholas already dealt with him. They then discuss Grin's real name and past, followed by Rimuru offhandedly mentioning that Guildmaster Yuki is kind of suspicious, though he promptly backtracks on that thought, but Hinata isn't ready to dismiss that possibility. Then recognizing they don't have any good leads, and that Roy's killer is still alive, they all agree to just stay vigilant. Snacks are then handed out, just as Hinata brings up her previous apology. Rimuru reminds her that all is forgiven, but Luminous doesn't want to be left owing him any favors. To this end, the two countries agree to open official diplomatic relations, however she still plans to get more revenge on that lizard. Renard speaks up concerned for this arrangement, prompting the rest of the paladins to voice their support of it. He goes on to explain that this is contradictory to their religion's core belief, that all monsters are inherently evil. Luminous boldly declares that she didn't create that rule, followed by Luis explaining that it came about later on due to Luminous protecting her followers from monsters. Renard accepts this explanation, but that doesn't change the fact that the masses believe all monsters to be evil. At this point though, they don't have much of a choice, since the world surely noticed 100 paladins marching on Tempest. Rimuru offers to just tell the rest of the world that Hinata won their duel, but Renard exclaims that may cause more people to attack Tempest, thinking the slime is weak. Though Rimuru isn't worried, because he doesn't have any enemies right now, so they all agree to report of Hinata's victory. Next, they discuss adding the Dwarven Kingdom into their diplomatic friendship, and Rimuru even decides to build a church in Tempest. With negotiations complete, Kurobe and Garm have a chance to inspect the paladin's holy armor, all the while Rimuru recreates and gifts Hanada her sword back. Though since magic weapons power up and evolve over time, it's not quite as strong as the original. In return, he'd like to analyze Hinata's armor, but she refuses as it's a one-of-a-kind relic. I've already analyzed it from our battle. Another feast is held, where Hinata is completely blown away upon tasting Rimuru's personal stash of white rice, followed by him boasting that his next objective is to tackle the lack of entertainment. She asked what his endgame looks like, causing him to proudly reveal his plan to implement public education, easy transportation, and even long-distance communication. 
Upon finishing, he realizes the room is dead silent, as Hinata points out that most countries would have kept all that a secret, and Rimuru can't deny the alcohol may have got the best of him. Resetting all resistances, they will not be adjustable for some time. With his forced sobriety, Rimuru watches Fritz steal from Hinata's plate, causing his face to meet the floor. The next day, the paladins head out, but Hinata pauses to warn Rimuru that Tempest's rapid development is sure to attract the attention of the angels. Luminous refers to them as a mere annoyance, followed by Rimuru declaring that he'll defend his home if it comes down to it. Though for now, Luminous sternly warns Rimuru to keep Veldora under control. Now, everyone did try their best to lie, but it doesn't take all that long for the rest of the world to learn that Rimuru defeated Hinata. This causes numerous different reactions within the world leaders. I mean, some fear the new demon lord, others are furious, and some even garner a sense of curiosity. Their stance, however, doesn't matter to Rimuru, as he sends out invitations inviting everyone important to his upcoming demon lord coronation. King Gazil is holding a meeting where his spies report that Hinata was defeated. An old wizard questions how they can be certain, since a powerful magic jammed all outside communication and observation. The spy believes the winner can be assumed due to the fact that the Holy Church has begun recognizing monsters as equal. That's definitely a fair point, but that would mean Demon Lord Rimuru is now stronger than King Gazil. He boldly agrees with her deduction, as the ministers declare the slime to be a threat, though they quickly fall in line after the king reminds them that Demon Lord Rimuru is a close friend. Gaziel is actually looking forward to what the slime will do next, and he's planning to capitalize on any new technology developed within Tempest. A certain minister then reveals that Rimuru invited King Gaziel to his festival. He fails to understand why Rimuru would host such a grand event, but that only makes him all the more interested. Gaziel then announces that he will formally accept this invitation, which makes some of the ministers nervous upon having their king leave the country. This is a good opportunity to show the world they're friends with Tempest, followed by one of the elders pointing out that King Gaziel will just sneak away if they tell him no. Over in the Sorceress Dynasty of Thalion, you find Archduke Erold talking to Emperor Elmesia Elru Thalion. She is one of the most pure-blooded elves alive, which means she's unbelievably beautiful while also never aging. Erold hands over Rimuru's invitation, but is met with pouting, as she's just jealous he went to Tempest without her. After reading it over, she asks for his opinion, but he wisely chooses to hold his tongue. Elmesia then brings up a famous baker named Yoshida, who also happens to be an otherworlder. She reveals that Ellen, Erold's daughter, has been regularly delivering Yoshida's sweets to her. Erold can't believe his daughter had been coming home, and Elmesia goes on to explain that Yoshida is closing down his store and moving to Tempest. Getting back to the topic at hand, Erold wants to know how they should respond to the invitation. He worries that the other royals may use this opportunity to try and take the throne, but Elmesia assures him not to worry about the small fry. She goes on to state that they need to be wary of this demon lord Rimuru, because he agreed to build them a road much too easily. This causes Erold to proudly reveal that he got Tempest to take over the entire construction process. Miss Emperor, however, declares this to be a mistake, but Erold reassures her that he ran the numbers, and that it's much cheaper for them to pay the tolls than to handle the construction. This is correct, but he forgot about all the merchants who will be using this road, and that they could have split the construction project with Tempest, which would have gave them room to negotiate any fees. Then due to the fact that Rimuru has surpassed Hinata, and even Guildmaster Yuki, Elmesia feels like she has no choice but to accept the invitation. This causes Erold to worry about her safety, so she orders him to deploy their secret service. Moving on to the Kingdom of Blumund, you see Molly discussing a terrible business idea with a Viscount. This guy is planning to use slaves to open a shop, causing Molly to point out that human trafficking is illegal. The Viscount then boldly admits that he even has an elf slave, which is super taboo and could even start an international conflict. Someone then bursts into the room, causing the Viscount to become angry. Rimuru immediately says he's sorry, followed by the Viscount basically saying that he'll accept intimate favors as an apology. This crosses the line, prompting Molly to kick him out of the office, all the while ignoring the numerous threats. And Rimuru worries that Molly might be in danger. 
He then explains his upcoming festival, and that thanks to Shuna's cooking skills and beautiful appearance, the famous Yoshida will be baking for their event. Vesta and Gabaru are going to use this as an opportunity to scout new recruits, and apparently Shion is planning something as well. Rimuru then brings up their latest business adventure, which is to open up fast food restaurants across this world. Molly is excited to report that the first batch of workers have been trained, prompting Rimuru to ask if they can assign his five best to a special project. Apparently, the legendary Storm Dragon Veldora is demanding he be allowed to run a hibachi stand at the festival. Molly suggests maybe giving him a nickname for this event, as he believes his staff would be utterly terrified. Next, they discuss how Tempest is already renowned for its hot springs and food, but Rimuru wants to add entertainment into that equation. He's thinking of taking advantage of the forest through tours, fishing, and even hunting. Molly then mentions that Inglacia has popularized the theater and organized fighting tournaments. They might as well follow Inglacia's lead, so Rimuru declares he will build a giant coliseum and wants Molly to be in charge of running everything. This merchant jumps for joy at the opportunity and begins thinking up numerous ideas. Unlike Inglacia, Tempest Coliseum will be open to the public. That way, they can attract as many regular customers as possible. This opens up the door to selling equipment, potions, training, and even organized betting. Then assuming Molly's Coliseum is a success, Rimuru even wants to put him in charge of the entirety of Tempest finances. After Rimuru leaves, Molly immediately promotes one of his employees to run this business, and thus begins preparing to leave. Outside, Rimuru begins thinking up a blueprint for the stadium. Blueprint has been successfully recreated from your memories. Now, due to Geld and Mield both being preoccupied, they'll have to rely on an upcoming craftsman. To that end, he summons Ranga, hands him the blueprint, and orders him to deliver it to GobQ. He also wants Ranga to find a bodyguard, who they can trust to keep Molly safe on his journey. Our slime then makes his way to the guild, where he asks to speak with the master. The secretary congratulates him on his promotion to B-plus rank adventurer, before stating it's such a shame that he shares a name with the new demon lord. The guild does happen to have a name-changing service, but Rimuru chooses to pass on that for now. Now Fuse was having a good day, until a certain demon lord came to visit. As Rimuru exclaims, that sounds like a huge hassle. They discuss the events surrounding the church's attack on Tempest, where Rimuru almost reveals Luminous's identity as Demon Lord Valentine. Our slime then hands over three invitations, one for Fuse, one for Blue Moon's King, and one for Grandmaster Yuki. He then casually mentions that Milam will be in attendance, before stepping out the door. A moment later, Rimuru is greeted by a strong-looking hobgoblin. Gobamon is actually stronger than Gobta, but his weakness is that he lacks teamwork. Rimuru orders him to stealthily guard Molly, and even promises to give Gobamon his katana as a reward. Then with the last of his errands taken care of, Demon Lord Rimuru returns home to begin focusing on the festival.